So now that we're talking about intermolecular forces, now the question becomes, can we actually identify whether or not some intermolecular forces are going to start to be exhibited between our molecules? Now to do this, we actually have quite a bit of review that needs to occur from our previous chemistries before we can actually talk about, okay, what's going to be the forces between our particles. So let's take a look at 12.1. Uh, I'm going to do a couple of these with you just so that we can then flip to kind of that last page to think about what actually is happening between our different molecules. So our first one here is methanol. Uh, remember your steps for drawing your Lewis structures. Uh, as we're looking at our different steps, we always know we, we pick a, sorry, we count up all of our valence electrons, we pick a central atom, we use single bonds to attach all of our outer atoms, and then we fill up any of our lone pairs. If we run short on electrons, then we start to do some double triple bonds. We've got extras that go on the middle. Uh, and then based on that, we'll kind of look at that central atom and then decide what our hybridization and shape might happen to be. So our first example here is methanol. So again, we start by counting up our valence electrons. Carbon's got four. So we've got four from the carbon. We've got one for each hydrogen. We got three, four of those from all the hydrogens. And then we, I think we end up with six more coming from our oxygen for a total of 14 electrons to stick this particular molecule together. Our next step is to pick a central atom. When in doubt, go with carbon. It makes lots of bonds. So put a central carbon. Carbon can make four bonds. Uh-oh, Pascadios. We got more than four things to attach. Carbon, and being in the second period on the periodic table, cannot have an expanded octet. We know sometimes these atoms can if they're in the, the third or lower row, uh, but carbon can't. It can only do four. And while there's a little hint in the formula, um, we've got this O and then another H, which kind of gives us a hint that we're going to see something funny like this. This gets us everything attached. So we've got a carbon with three hydrogens. We then hook up with an oxygen and then hook another hydrogen on the end. Each Remember that each line here represents two electrons. We've got two, four, six, eight, ten coming from our single bonds, that leaves us four left over. Hydrogen doesn't need any more, carbon's full at eight. The only person who needs some additional electrons, I believe, is gonna be that oxygen. So here's our Lewis structure for our methanol. Uh, let's go back to the kind of the central atom. In this case, it is that carbon. Uh, in this particular shape, this is gonna be a tetrahedral shape. I'm just gonna put tetra, because I'm gonna run out of space. Cool, again, going back to that central atom, carbon, if we're thinking about four bond areas, we're gonna to need to hybridize four orbitals. We're gonna use an S and then three Ps, so we're, this is SP3 hybridized. If we're thinking about this molecule, is it symmetrical? It is not, so this is very much gonna be polar. In fact, I believe, if memory serves, this region right here uh, will actually allow us to perform hydrogen bonding because we've got a hydrogen bonded directly to an oxygen. Cool, let's look at another example here uh, for our water. Our water, we've got two electrons coming from the hydrogen plus another six from the water for a total of eight. Uh, many of you know what our water molecule is gonna look like. It's kind of our Mickey Mouse. It is our species that looks something like this. It would be a straight linear line, but because of the lone pairs, it is bent. We've got four regions of electrons, two in bonds, two in those lone pairs, which means we are still sp3 hybridized. And if we're thinking about this particular molecule, it is non-symmetrical. There's nothing top to bottom here. So this is also going to be a polar molecule. This tells us that there's a positive side and a negative side, which opens up our intermolecular forces to our dipole-dipole scenarios, assuming we don't have a special interaction here. But again, we've got another oxygen. Well, we actually got two of them. We've got two hydrogens and ox bonded directly to oxygens, which means when we start to think about this molecule, it also would have some hydrogen bonding taking place. If we drop on down to that third page then, um, I think the example or the, the question that we're looking at here is going to be kind of our um, sorry, it was our methanol and water. I'm jumping down a little bit, but it's the first two structures. The question becomes what intermolecular force or forces could be existing between these molecules? Well, here's kind of a spoiler. Any molecule that has valence electrons around it are always going to have LDF forces. Technically, that's going to be true for all of these molecules. The question then becomes, are there any specifically acting between these two species. Well, they're both polar, right? We've decided up above that they're both polar, so this would be a dipole-dipole. 
Oh, spelling. So this is a dipole dipole. Dipole dipole, I'm gonna abbreviate dipole dipole, dipole die. Uh, and because they both have that hydrogen bonding going on in there, we would also have our H bond present. Sorry, I'm running out of space. Uh, if we were to ask which of these is most significant, it actually is gonna be that hydrogen bonding as the most significant interaction between these two particular molecules. This is why they are so very much miscible or mixing in solution. Uh, cool, just wanna do one of these with you so you can get a feel for what this is gonna look like. Uh, coming on back, we're gonna actually turn in uh, this final page of this handout so that I can see where you're at with identifying intermolecular forces. Uh, and then we'll kind of check all the structures together coming back on Wednesday.